This video was brought to you by CuriosityStream. Last week, Russian occupying forces in four Ukrainian oblasts, Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson and Zaporizhia, all announced they would be holding referendums on a session to the Russian Federation. These referendums concluded earlier this week, and unsurprisingly, every oblast apparently voted for a session with greater than 50% turnout. So in this video, we're going to take a look at what actually happened on the ground, what might happen next, and how this might affect the state of play on the battlefield. So let's start by explaining exactly what happened. On Tuesday, the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics, the two groups formed in reaction to the 2014 Maiden Uprising that are supported by Russia, announced that they would be holding referendums on a session to the Russian Federation. This isn't actually the first time they've tried this. Since 2014, both groups have been fighting a war against Ukrainian government forces, with the intent of at least ceding from Ukraine. Both groups claimed independence from Ukraine in April 2014, after successfully storming the government headquarters of the respective regional state administration, but quickly backed down and said they would instead hold referendums on Donetsk and Luhansk independence, which were organised for May 2014. The People's Republics were apparently inspired by what happened in Crimea in March, when Russian troops organised a referendum on Crimea's accession to the Russian Federation, which presaged the Russian annexation of Crimea. On May the 11th, they held binary yes-no referendums, asking their local populations whether they supported, quote, state self-rule of their respective People's Republics. Unsurprisingly, both referendums apparently came out in favour of independence, with 96.2% in favour of Luhansk and 89% in favour of Donetsk. There were reports of widespread fraud, and the Ukrainian Secret Service even released an audio recording of a phone call between a Donetsk separatist leader and a Russian paramilitary where they agreed in advance to claim that 89% of people voted in favour of independence, which is, well, exactly what the result ended up being. While neither group occupied the entire territory of either Donetsk or Luhansk, after the referendum they claimed the entirety of Donbass as independent republics. Interestingly, while the Kremlin expressed, quote, respect for the result and urged a, quote, civilised implementation, at the time Moscow basically ignored the referendums and refused to recognise the republics as sovereign states. As you'd expect, the Ukrainian government said that the referendums were illegal and no UN member recognised either republic. Now, why Russia didn't recognise the 2014 referendum as they did with Crimea is anyone's guess. They probably thought the political fallout would be too great, or perhaps they were optimistic about achieving a better negotiated settlement with Kyiv. Whatever the reason, Putin's thinking has clearly changed since. In February, three days before his invasion of Ukraine, Putin finally recognised the DPR and LPR as independent states. On Tuesday morning last week, both groups said they would be holding referendums on a session to the Russian Federation. A few hours later, Russian occupying forces in the Kherson Oblast and the Zaporizhia Oblast said they would be doing the same thing, despite the fact that Ukrainian forces still control 40% of Donetsk and 30% of Zaporizhia, including the regional capital, which amounts for 40% of the Oblast's total population. Unlike in 2014, this time the Kremlin said that they would recognise the results of the referendum, which were due to conclude on Tuesday. According to RAA Novotsi, a branch of Russian state media, all four oblasts voted overwhelmingly in favour of a session. In Donetsk it was 99%, in Luhansk 98%, in Zaporizhia 93%, and in Kherson 87%. Now, it goes without saying that these results are ridiculously implausible. Polling from occupied areas, which are in general more pro-Russian than the rest of Ukraine, have found that support for accession into Russia rarely rises above 50%. A poll in Donbass from January this year, just a month before the war started, with over 4,000 respondents, found that only 25% of respondents were in favour of joining the Russian Federation, with roughly 50% of respondents instead in favour of staying within Ukraine, possibly with greater autonomy. 
Now, Putin is yet to actually accept these regions into the Russian Federation, but this seems basically inevitable and there are rumours that he'll announce it on Friday. Anyway, as you'd expect, most of the international community quickly decried these referendums as illegitimate. The UK placed even more sanctions on Russia, including individuals involved in carrying out the referendums, while both the White House and the EU described them as sham referendums. Interestingly, even countries who are usually more neutral on the issue went out of their way to criticise them. Turkey stated that, as with Crimea, it does not recognise Russia's unilateral annexation attempts, and both India and China made pointed statements reiterating their support for, quote, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Even Serbia, who've so far been pretty cushy with Moscow, came out against the referendums, arguing that it would be, quote, against their national interests for Serbia to endorse Russia's territorial claims. Whilst this doesn't mean that countries like Serbia have suddenly turned against Russia, it's a symptom of the fact that, as Russia's quote-unquote special military operation becomes a war involving mobilisation and annexation of Ukrainian territory, other countries like India and China will find it harder and harder to defend. So, given the referendums were a. completely implausible and b. badly received by even Russia's allies, why did they bother? Well, it's probably because these referendums, and the annexation that will inevitably follow, will allow Russia to escalate the war in Ukraine. If Russia can claim that it's defending Russian territory, not just performing a, quote, special military operation in Ukraine, then it can justify more extreme military action, at least under its own military doctrine. For example, Russia's nuclear doctrine, at least according to the latest version of Russia's military doctrine published in 2014, only allows for a first strike in the event that the, quote, very existence of the Russian state is threatened. Obviously, if Putin claims these parts of Ukraine as part of the Russian Federation, then he's more likely to claim that Ukrainian operations amount to a threat to Russia itself, and therefore justify the use of nuclear weapons. We're not saying that nuclear war is likely, but just that referendums are probably more about legitimising and threatening escalation on the battlefield than, well, establishing democratic consent. Well, none of that was good news. But if you wanted cheering up, then we've got a handful of fun videos too. Like our team attempting the British citizenship test, our blooper reel, ethnic Hungarians. Is that Transylvania? Is that a real place? Is that tra like who the f knew Transylvania was a real place? Am I an idiot? I thought it was made up. Our office tour and our interview with TV expert Scott Bryan about why Piers Morgan and Talk TV are failing. Now, all of these videos are exclusive to the streaming service that we made with our creator friends, Nebula. Now, don't worry, I know that times are really tough at the moment, and that's why it's good news that Nebula is only about a dollar a month if you sign up using the Nebula Curiosity Stream bundle. Here's how it works. We reached out to the good chaps at Curiosity Stream and said, hey, you have a superb streaming service full of some of the most high quality documentaries available online. They emailed back saying, you mean highest quality, but sure. Now, I don't always appreciate pedantry like this, but they're right, we should have said highest, and they put forward an offer that we couldn't refuse. They said that anyone who signed up to their streaming service using this link, it's in the description, don't worry, will get access to Nebula absolutely free. Now, I like free things, so we said yes. So if you click the link below, you'll pay less than $15 a year for Curiosity Stream and all of the extra TLDR stuff on Nebula. That's just over a dollar a month. So get yourself exclusive TLDR videos that will never come to YouTube. All of our videos ad free and some of our videos earlier than they come to YouTube by signing up now. For legal reasons, this exchange is entirely fictionalized. And honestly, I don't know how the deal was done. I'm not a legal kind of guy, so I wasn't in the room when it happened anyway. Also, just because I made this up doesn't mean that the rest of the stuff in this video wasn't true. Everything else I say is always 100% accurate, okay? Regardless, you should sign up.